Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Subtext Podcast Archives. These are the long lost episodes of the Subtext that were originally produced between 2015 and 2017. In 2018, the Subtext moved to American Theatre Magazine, and we've been producing the pod there monthly ever since. These time capsules are being shared here in their entirety, including plenty of outdated references and advertisements for events far in the past. If you enjoy them, please subscribe to the current podcast feed for the subtext or stream new episodes on the website for American Theatre Magazine. Thank you for listening. This month's The Subtext will be a little longer because I'm interviewing two different playwrights. I decided to skip the usual intro and get right to it. But first, I want to share a quote I read the other day in the LA Times. It's from an article about the legendary playwright Maria Irene Fornes. Here it is. If theater is to be successful, it must be loved like one loves an animal that one wonders at, not like one loves a formula. If people would love the theater like they love an animal, they would enjoy the theater, and they would want to go to the theater. And if you asked them, what is utopia, they would say, theater is utopia. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to The Subtext. My name is Brian James Polak. I'm a playwright and lover of donuts. This month, I spend time with playwrights Kemp Powers and Eliza Clark, both strangers to me until this interview, and now I'm their biggest fans, and maybe you will be as well. But before we get to the interviews, this month's sponsor is South Coast Repertory. Every spring, new play fans gather at South Coast Repertory in Costa Mesa, California, for the Pacific Playwrights Festival, featuring two world premiere productions, five staged readings, and an engaging panel discussion with the playwrights. Join audiences and industry pros from across the country April 22nd through 24th for the 19th annual Pacific Playwrights Festival. For tickets and information, visit scr.org. All right. First up is Kent Powers, author of One Night in Miami, which ran forever at Rogue Machine here in L.A., Kemp's play, Little Black Shadows, will be presented at South Coast Pacific Playwrights Festival Friday, April 22nd. One other thing about Kemp, he has a moth story that didn't come up during our interview, but it's, it's, it's truly an incredible story about something that happened when he was young. I highly recommend you go to the moth website and give it a listen after, you know, after you listen to this. Right. I, I've, I've wondered aloud to people, like, I wonder if L.A. is ever going to get to the point where theaters start just having later Friday night show times. Because mm-hmm. if you, so many people get off of work at 6 and can't make an 8 p.m. show time if they're on the west side like, and have to get to downtown, yeah. like, they can't right. do it. Yeah. Or they're really, really late. And it's just getting worse. I mean, if you happen to be downtown and you're going to the taper or something like that, it's one thing. But if you're in, if you're working in Santa Monica and you have to get downtown and you get off at 6.30, you're going to be like, oh, mm-hmm. what do I... Because <laughs> I've yeah. been in that situation where I've barely, barely made show times mm-hmm. coming from the west side or even been a few minutes late and then things are starting at 8, so I don't know. It's a... Uh, well, you 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 grew up in New York, right? Right, In the right. city in... In Brooklyn. Brooklyn? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that couldn't be any more different. Right, right. right. It, I mean... <sighs> It, 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 the only cli- the only thing more cliche than sitting in LA and talking about traffic is talking about Brooklyn in the eighties and going <laughs> down like some kind of n- nostalgia trip. So I, you know, I am nothing but full of cliches. So, <laughs> so, so bring it. <laughs> but I, I mean, it was a completely. You have to understand that growing up for me, uh, the first neighborhood that I really remember us being in was Coney Island, which is you have your back to the city you know mm-hmm. what i mean it's one of the it's one of the few neighborhoods in in town where no matter where you are you can't see manhattan you know it's like you see the beach that's kind of like stillwell avenue is your your point of reference and it's the last stop for me it was the last stop on the f train so living off of neptune you just the the city which is what we call manhattan was a place we went to maybe twice a year Really? Yeah, like wow. that's how that's how infrequently my world was like. I, I I tell people I say Brooklyn people we were townies, 
You know, leaving leaving the block was a big deal, and leaving the neighborhood was just like an adventure. And going to the city was something that was incredibly rare. I mean, the, my mother she took me to the Cloisters Museum in Inwood. And that was like a mind-blowing thing for me as a kid. Going to the Cloisters was literally like going to a medieval castle. Like to me, it was like, why bother going to Europe? I've right. got Europe right here. Right. Like, it was that type of attitude. And thankfully for our, my my mom took me to my first um, Broadway show. And I knew what Broadway was, but I'd never been... I'd seen commercials. There were always commercials for a chorus line or commercials for cats. You know, there were always these mm-hmm. commercials but uh, for these shows that... I figured I'd never get a chance to see, so my mom was like, I got tickets to a Broadway show, we're going to Manhattan, we're going to the city, we're gonna, gonna go to a musical. And I was so excited, and I, I remember it so vividly. The first musical I saw was La Cage of Faux, mm-hmm. and it was contrary to what someone might expect being a Brooklyn townie, it changed my life. It was one of the two things that really, I mean, Brooklyn was really homophobic back then, so it was kind of a fascinating thing to be enjoying in a musical um the the story of of the birdcage and the other thing was a school trip um we would often go to the the pap theater on school trips and my first non-musical play was shakespeare's the tempest and i i barely listened to the play because growing up on television i i was sitting there and i was in like the front row and Prospero was standing about 10 feet away from me and I remember vividly that the floor had gravel and I just could not compute that these were live human beings acting this out and at the time I couldn't stop thinking how are they not making any mistakes you know like I, I felt like there's no way you can have this much memorized and then the second question popped up like how do they see me (laughs) <laughs> he's he's got to – he's right there. He's really got to see me. So I, I remember reaching down and kind of like touching the gravel and then grabbing like a handful of it in my hand and chucking it at Prospero. Really? Yeah. In the middle of the play? <laughs> yeah, I chucked it right at him. And I got into a little bit of trouble, Not, but oh it's, it, it sounds like I was being just a little shit. But it wasn't coming from that place. It was coming from this place of like, how, do they see me? Like you, this uh, growing up on the TV, being able to reach out and touch someone, it was like magical. Like you were, in it was it. you. You were, you were like it. you wanted to. It's like wanting to to poke something with a stick. Yeah. Because you can't believe it's alive. So, given it's a bunch of inner city kids, and I'm sure people are like, that's why we don't have these assholes in the theater. Right. I think the opposite. That's why, like with my own work, when you bring in a new audience and people kind of are quote unquote misbehaving, I don't think enough energy goes into dealing with the transition for people who've never been in the theater before. Because imagine if it was, you'll never go into a play again, Kemp Powers. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like my my life's love. It's just the first time I was exposed to it, I couldn't really process what I was seeing. So the first time I went to London in my early 20s I flew out there to see the Tempest at the Barbican you know that's how much it stuck with me yeah that moment that it became one of my favorite Shakespeare plays of all time not because I thought it was his best play but it was the play that helped me fall in love with theater so you know I I don't know why I told you that story other than an emotional bond between between you and it yes Right, and I think that's probably what separates theater from other forms. And of, it can do that. I mean, any sometimes it's that one person who's misbehaving, so to speak, whose mind is really being blown. And it, it, <laughs> when my play, my play ran in Baltimore last year, and it was really funny because a lot of family members came from New York mm-hmm. or in Virginia to Baltimore to see the play because um, one night in Miami. Yeah, they they saw it. And a lot of people, like I think maybe 40 family members came out for that and I got very very sick so I ended up missing opening night I was in Baltimore but I was in the hospital oh, God. and and missed opening night and but everyone had a really really good time and then I think it was my sister or one of my relatives was like oh yeah your your nephew he posted a cool little video of your play and I said wait what do you mean <laughs> and they pull up a YouTube video 
and he's recorded like <laughs> 15 minutes of the play and put it on YouTube. I mean, it's down now, but I'm in a hospital bed just livid. I'm like telling my sister, tell your son. Right. And, and I'm thinking, how did he sit there in the theater like it, he like he was watching The Last Dragon, mm-hmm. you know, just recording this whole scene. And, and it was down within a, a couple of hours. But as angry as I was, it made me laugh because I thought about my moment yeah. where he never, he was in his early 20s, but he'd never really been exposed to something yeah. quite like that. And he just was like, I'm loving this. Let me get this. Let me, I'm so proud and excited. Let me just put it up because kids just put shit up in YouTube. Right, and it's part of the the sort of like social media sharing right. mentality. Like I'm experiencing a thing and I want other people to see what Exactly. Right when you now. go out and see something live you enjoy, you start recording it. Yeah. And it hadn't even dawned on me. So that just shows you that as ignorant as I thought I was being then, it's like, no, we all, when we're when it's something new, not everyone is groomed for the etiquette of it. And that's not excusing people like the guy who jumped on stage and plugged in his iPhone and all that kind of behavior. But I don't think enough energy goes into, you talk about things like audience outreach. Mm -hmm. What does that really mean? We just want a new group of people's money? Mm. Or do we want to help make them our audience? I mean, I think a decision's got to really be made because it's disingenuous to say, oh, we're, we're just giving some free tickets and here's the rules. And you, you've got to figure out a way to help people acclimate to, to a new experience, you yeah. know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so well, not only that, but there are sort of like the way things are done and the way we behave in theater. And there's a certain sort of... Um, you know, when you're coming to the theater for the first time, you need to understand there are certain, like, protocols and, and ways of being polite. And, right. And like, you don't talk. But then there is the a changing audience. Like, we are changing as people, and I think that theater still needs to be able to adapt to people. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, I was. The, it's funny that in mul- dealing with multiple casts, if you ask them, if you asked a lot of actors who were in regional plays... You, you'd be surprised how many will say their favorite performance date, um, at least my anecdotal surveying people, seems to be the high school matinee. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> Which is a boisterous, it's a boisterous crowd, and they, they'll, there'll be callbacks. But even the actors can enjoy it. Again, and it's not excusing certain behaviors, but I just think it's part of the process. I mean, when my play ran, when One Night in Miami ran at Rogue Machine, up to that point, it, it brought in a lot of new audience members that we hadn't really seen before. And I look back on some of the more, I sat through a lot of a lot of performances of the play there because I was still working on it and doing revisions and stuff like that. And some of the most hysterical things kept happening. And at the end of the show, the actors, most of the cast would go out and a bunch of us would go out to Amalfi and get drinks. And we would just laugh about the absurd character who would show up for tonight's show. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I I saw it as a net positive. I mean, there was one guy who came in with a shopping bag, and he had like a full dinner in Tupperware dishes. <laughs> and he t- pulled out one giant metal spoon. He sat in the front row. Right. And as soon as he opened it, I smelled the food in the balcony. <laughs> and I couldn't help but laugh because the ushers, they don't know how to deal with this guy. Right, right. And the actors can see him, and he's, like, cracking open a Coke, like, psh, and <laughs> you can hear him sipping in the balcony. And then I think, oh, my God, like, Broadway plays these days. I can't imagine. Paying. Are these old, st- stodgy audience members. But someone's paid $400 because yeah. they want to see Denzel right. or some celebrity, and you expect her to not be like, Denzel, you fine. Like, it's, I'm sorry, man, but... You know how many movies, how many blockbuster movies it takes to equal one Broadway ticket? Right. And if it's someone, if it's a, if it's a cult, you're cultivating a new audience and there, that period of acclimation is happening on this big celebrity studded stage, you're, you're going to have things like 
that dude feeling entitled to jump on stage and plug in his iPhone because he's like, I paid two hundred fucking dollars for well, this. Like I'm what gonna. You said, <laughs> what you said before about it, you, you, we grow up with a screen in front of us, right. like a TV or a movie screen in front of us, and now it's right there in front of us, and we can touch it. I mean, you're not sitting so close to Denzel that you can reach out and touch him, but you're in the same room with him. Exactly. You know, that's amazing. Exactly. I mean, now for some people, that's why they pay two hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. To sit in the same room with their favorite celebrity. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a model that that seems to be the the model of I should say Broadway plays, not musicals. Right. But um, you know, you don't get to reap that that billion dollar business and <laughs> not have to. I mean, people talk in movie theaters, right? Sure. Yeah, all the time. So it's a. Uh, but the beha- The funny thing is, I, I think about movie theater behavior compared to theater behavior a lot, and. Uh, what I notice is that movies will often run two hours. That's sort of like an, uh, a normal length of time for a movie. And people will go and sit through a two-hour movie, and that's okay. But if you have a play that runs over 90 minutes, you better have an act break. Because oh, I'm not yeah. going to sit here... I'm not going to sit here for that long without an act break. And I'm like, but do you do you have that same kind of yearning in a movie? No, you'll sit there in the movie theater and you'll watch the two hour and 20 minute movie. Right. And then you go go to the bathroom after. Right. Right. I mean, I kind of, I, I tend to notice plays that I've seen recently are either 90 minutes, no intermission, or you're going to get a three and a half hour <laughs> brutalizing. I mean, just... I've seen some marathon plays where I was enjoying it going into hour two and going into hour three. I'm just like, I can't take anymore. Yeah. And so, I I mean, but I've also seen some incredibly long plays that didn't have an intermission that I sat through it and enjoyed it. I mean, the Sunset Limited was a really good play that was... It wasn't three hours, but it was pretty damn long to not have an act break. break. And But I... I felt myself in, and these guys were sitting in his apartment right. with one of them chained. So yeah. I, I, it depends on the play, to 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 be honest. It but, just seems uh, like we have a different sort of standard. Right. Because there's, I guess, the psychological experience of being in the same room with the action is different than the separation between you and a screen. Right, right. It is. It is. And I guess the the uh, the cultural expectation is that if you get up in a movie theater and step out, that's sort of like, eh, you shrug your shoulders, people do that. But in the theater, if you're getting up, yeah, that is like, why are you insane? How can you be doing this? You're right. disturbing my entire experience. It is funny I've noticed with longer plays how many people don't come back after the intermission. Yeah. And I've noticed that everywhere. Um, everywhere I've seen plays, I've noticed a lot of times where... If it's a long, if it's over two hours, the intermission, I see a lot of empty seats where, where it's just kind of like, I guess they had enough. I don't know. Like, I guess they figured they got the gist of it. It's mm-hmm. kind of a crazy idea that they people wouldn't stay, but I've, but I've seen a, a lot more of that. And in, in I feel, years. I feel like we're falling deep into the, uh, like curmudgeonly, like when I go to the theater, I want to talk about, I want to talk, I want to, I want to circle this back to you. Okay. You know, I've got, I've got Ken Powers for a very short period of time (laughs) and I want to take advantage. Um, a couple curiosities about you that I have. I want to talk about One Night in Miami, but before we get to that, I'm, I'm very curious about why the hell you, did you decide to write plays? That seems like an insane thing to decide to do when you are somebody who is clearly uh, on a, su- a path of success as a as a journalist and a writer to suddenly switch to this form that in like could I mean you're doing you're obviously doing quite well but when you start you are not going to make any money doing this right. you're not going to sustain yourself well motiv- money was never a motivation and, and and I should add to that that deciding to do that in Los Angeles put me amongst the unicorns so to speak because I can't tell you how many people made jokes like oh you must be the only person who came to LA for success and riches in theater (laughs) and and it wasn't a motivation it really wasn't at all I mean uh, again I've always been a tremendous fan of theater even all my almost 20 years as a journalist I mean my first real job um, out of college was as a PR assistant at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. So I kind of was in this position where I was helping put together the programs 
and you have people like Arthur Miller and August Wilson coming through the theater and you know, I'd have to like drive August Wilson from his hotel to the theater and Are you serious? Yeah, but but understand I was I was that young guy who was just there to grab what they needed. And it kind of puts you in this mental space where you're like, oh, yeah, I'll never be able to do what any of these people have done. You know, like they're as much as I love this this art form, there are people coming through who've gone to schools where they studied theater um, like Yale. And and you're a guy who just enjoys writing. Mm -hmm. And that's never promoted as any kind of career path to to do that thing that you enjoy. And so when my first journalism job presented itself, of course I jumped into that because I also love journalism. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done it for almost 20 years if I didn't love it. But I've always been an avid theater goer. And I just think getting here to Los Angeles presented this... Let me, let me wind it back a little bit. I ended up involved in theater because of Rogue Machine Theater and the 99-seat theater scene, which is its own kind of unique animal. And that it has an agility where you can just kind of like write something and just get it up. Mm -hmm. And it's it really wouldn't exist anywhere outside of Los Angeles just because of the ridiculous amount of resources, not just actors, but writers and all these people who just happen to be here but don't have much to do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I came into Rogue Machine more as a storyteller. Um, I, I met uh, another Rogue Machine company member um, through a mutual friend mm -hmm. and I, who knew us, me as a journalist. She was a publicist. And she knew me as a journalist and this other guy, John Polano, who was a writer at Rogue Machine, who was, uh, worked in publicity at Nintendo at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was covering video games. So a mutual friend of ours was just like, you guys should meet each other. Um, he's into theater. He's acting and doing other things. So I went down and um, went to a Rant and Rave, which is their monthly storytelling show. I went to the second Rant and Rave number two. I think they're on like number 70. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh I, oh, I could tell a true story. I think this would be interesting. So he invited me and I came back and I ended up telling a story at Rant and Rave. And telling one story turned into telling five stories, six stories, seven stories, eight stories. Telling stories at other shows around L.A. I started telling stories for The Moth and things like that. And then I got invited to become a member of the company. And it was just kind of awkward. You're a member of this company, but you're not an actor. You're not a, a playwright, so to speak. So I started writing um, short plays, 24-hour plays. We, Rogue Machine, did these 24-hour play festivals. And... I kind of started working. Part of it is you're you're involved in so many plays from the ground level. You're mm -hmm. seeing how they're constructed. And as opposed to being exposed to writers who are Arthur Miller, um, who, who you're exposed to writers who were just like you, mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to do the same things. And you're a part of their process. So doing 24-hour plays where you kind of you get you get the topic and you just have to have the agility to churn something out. That was the first time I really said to myself, oh, I'm pretty, I'm better at this than I think I am. What were you drawing on? For? for so you're, you're, I'm assuming you're kind of, you're sort of operating out of instinct at this point when you're right. just, so what, what is it that you're pulling from in your, in your writing experience? Like, it's all storytelling though. I mean, I was a storyteller as a journalist. I was a storyteller as a storyteller. I'm a storyteller as a playwright. Mm -hmm. I'm a storyteller as a screenwriter. I mean, that's, it's all storytelling. And there are some, I don't want to call them rules, but there's base things that I kind of stick to no matter what story I'm telling. And one of the, one of the basic things is just why should anyone other than me want to sit through this story? Why is it important? And it doesn't have to be important to everyone. It doesn't have to be important to a mass audience, but it has to be something in my heart I believe is an important tale to be told. Mm -hmm. And starting with that as my basis, um... I've come up with what I think are some pretty good ideas. Um, a lot of it draws from my own personal experience. A lot of it draws just from things that I've always been supremely interested in. Uh, oddly enough, being a journalist was like being in school for 20 years. So you learn tons and tons about so many interesting topics that, to be perfectly honest, aren't meant to be explored in film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that's the other weird thing about L.A. is if you have a good idea, the first thing out of anyone's mind is, it should be a movie. Right. And writing a play is so incredibly different than writing a television show or a film and they're different mediums i think the skills to 
succeed in those mediums cross over to one another, but they are incredibly different. There are some plays, there's an inherent theatrical component to the stage that makes it unique and can, under, under certain circumstances can make it transcendent. Mm-hmm. And so there's things that I can, people will say there's things that you can do in film that you can never do anywhere else. I think there's things you can do in theater that can't be replicated in any other medium. So, um, and it's the ability to make the small story big. That's one of them. I mean, I, I just, you, you do a movie, you, let's say you do a film and it's uh, about a guy stuck in a pine box. It's going to be this indie film and it's going to be claustrophobic. Mm-hmm. You could do a play about a guy stuck in a pine box and it's going to be big. Mm-hmm. You see, you, do you kind of get what I'm saying? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but so yeah, I mean, that's that was pretty much my start. I mean, it's it's no small irony that a guy born and raised in New York would feel so excluded from theater. But again, I. I, I studied English. I became a journalist. Um, I had really no connection to the theater scene in New York growing up there because I was I was one of those townie kids mm-hmm. who kind of secretly was able to enjoy plays and just not tell any of his friends about it. Mm-hmm. But you kind of come out here, and because <laughs> because no one has any respect for anything that we were doing anyway, you can actually try some new things. And there's you a freedom, can, right? There's, a freedom there's an incredible freedom yeah. to just, you know what? Who's why can't we do this? Mm-hmm. Why can't we try to do a play about this or do a play about that? And all, and I think that you find there are different voices that are important voices. You know, there's and so it just it suited me. Again, I, I make no. I always tell people um, I would never have been able to make the transition into a playwright if I hadn't been in Los Angeles. So I'm a New Yorker, born and raised, but I'm a Los Angeles playwright, mm-hmm. and I'm pretty proud of that. That's great. Uh, you don't hear that a lot. No, I know, you know but you hear about a lot of playwrights who are in Los Angeles. Exactly, and there's a tremendous I'm difference. I'm a playwright. I am based in Los Angeles. Yes, I'm an yeah. I'm an LA playwright. Yeah, <laughs> sing it. Yeah. Um, I, I've been re- I've been I've been thinking a lot about writing. Uh, about real life people mm-hmm. and uh, One Night in Miami is about four real life people right? and it's about uh, these four people being which is a true story the four of them convened in this one place on this one particular night right? and uh, I feel as a writer myself insecure about writing something where there isn't proof you know, right. like taking that leap and just saying, I'm going to make a lot of assumptions and I'm just going to uh, write this thing and it's going to come from it's going to come from me. And I'm going to put words into the mouths of real life people, some of whom are still alive today. Right. You know? Of course. Um, I'm I'm really curious about process. So the idea, can you sort of nutshell what, what Night Miami is and then sort of tell me how you sort of came to that? Sure. Um, I mean, it's a it's a play about um, February of uh, February nineteen sixty four. February twenty fifth, nineteen sixty four, was the the night that Cassius Clay um, beat Sonny Liston to become world heavyweight champion. And the next morning is when he announced to the world um, that he was in the Nation of Islam. And what a lot of people didn't realize is that night, no one thought he was going to win. So that night, he went back to Malcolm X's motel room in Overtown, the the black section of Miami, and he spent the evening, a quiet evening, with um, Malcolm, um, Jim Brown, who was like the world's greatest football player, and Sam Cooke, the the singer. And I found this out just reading, I I first found out that this night really happened, um, reading a wonderful sports slash civil rights book written by the late Mike Marcusi um, called Redemption Song, Muhammad Ali and the Spirit of the 60s. And I came across that one paragraph and said to myself, like, oh, my God, those are my four favorite guys. And they knew each other. It was like accidentally discovering the Black Avengers. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So they knew each other and they were all in this one place. Yes. And and it was more than just like they passed through. So it was just one night they happened to be in the same room because you could do that with anything. What fascinated me was that they appeared to actually be friends. Mm-hmm. So over a period of a few years, these guys had been hanging out with each other a lot. Mm-hmm. So I tore through. I went out and just put myself on this mission to find as many biographies as I could 
about each one of them. And I would read a biography or two or three or four on Malcolm or Ali or Sam Cooke or Jim Brown, and I'd read it and enjoy it. Then I'd go and start trying to connect the dots. I'd look for, I try to, I was trying to kind of track their friendship. Mm -hmm. And then looking at just history, what happened before and what happened after. I came up with, while I put the words in their mouths and everything that happens in this room is fictional, it's also believable based on all that I learned about each of them, where they were mentally, emotionally Mm -hmm. in the days and weeks leading up to it and where they were mentally and emotionally in the days and weeks after the night. Keep in mind, two of them were dead within a year that night, Malcolm X and Sam Cooke. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X had written A Change Is Gonna Come, but it hadn't been released yet. So it was going to come out posthumously. Um, And so having all this ammunition... It was like, what would what would these guys have to say to each other in a room this night? And then the most important component was looking at their ages. On this night, um, Cassius Clay, soon to be Muhammad Ali, was 22 years old. Jim Brown was 28. Um, Malcolm was the elder statesman at 39. Mm-hmm. And Sam Cooke was like a 32. So, and then looking at their, what I call their their fame paradigm, If you had to rank them today, the most famous would be Muhammad Ali. Okay? Right. And But if you rank them on that night, the most famous two people in that room were Jim Brown and Sam Cooke. Yeah. By a country mile. Mm -hmm. Um, Malcolm would have been viewed less like the Malcolm is viewed today, more like a fringe kind of (laughs) agitator. Political activist. Right. He would have been like Al Sharpton. Yeah. Okay? And then Cassius would have been the nobody. So you have these, I said, okay, you have three big brothers fighting over their little brother mm. and his influence and him making what is going to be the most important decision of his life. And that was my, that's the way I tried to tackle it. So regardless of what really did transpire, and there were things that I found out reading enough about it, like, you know, all they had to eat was vanilla ice cream. That's in the play. That wasn't my concoction. That's really what they were working with that night. Um, and there were a few other Muslim guards there from the Nation of Islam, so that's not my concoction. That's that's true. So I, there, there's lots of fact in the the fiction of my exploring this factual night. And, and you uh, felt, you, did you feel any insecurity around writing their dialogue and making choices for their behaviors? I did initially, and that's why the early drafts of it really stunk because mm-hmm. I was still in iconography mode. And then when I kind of freed myself and said, all right, enough is enough. Let me just have these be real characters who happen to be this age. Keep in mind, I'm writing the play, and um, as I'm older than all of them were on that night, Mm -hmm. and I don't know everything. I feel like a babe in the woods. So how must they feel, each one of them, considering all the weight they have on their shoulders? And that kind of freed me a lot. Um, And and, and that's when I got really, really comfortable and, and because... Have to, you have to understand that if you, I, I said, I, when people ask me who I wrote that play for, I said I wrote it for myself at 19 years old because I wish I would have known at 19 this story. Mm. And what, ins- what would have inspired me as a young man wasn't seeing these icons being icons and spouting speeches and it would have been having them be relatable to me and, and as considering they were about my age. And, and dealing with real issues of someone that age who might happen to be famous or might happen to be wealthy or might happen to be influential. But that creates its own insecurities and its own challenges. So, again, at least there, it might not be what they said exactly. Well, it wasn't what they said exactly, but you can't question that these are plausible reactions that they have both to one another and to the situation at hand. Was there any blowback from... The, the estates or the people? No. I mean, Abco Records, which owns the life rights and the music rights to Sam Cooke, actually came on as a producer of the play. So the next production that's happening um, in London um, in October, I, well, I, I can't I can't announce the specifics of it yet. It'll be announced in about a month. Mm-hmm. But um, they're, they're actually the producers of the next iteration of the play. So it's uh, it's moving on. It's having a life, and I'm you know I'm happy about that. And um, but again, it was a it was an uphill battle, and it was worth every bit of the effort. And then you kind of move on to the next thing, you know. So. I have to say, uh, as somebody who is still 
I'm fledgling and I'm still working and I'm still writing and I'm trying to get plays out into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I am so unbelievably inspired by the story of this particular play and and you as a playwright and mm -hmm. and your journey because you weren't a, you weren't really writing plays you were sort of working out you were working on this craft and you were figuring it out and here's the first full length play you have that gets produced and it gets produced at your home theater where mm -hmm. you've learned so much and it sort of like was your entree into the theater world and mm -hmm. having a community and then it launches you. It's amazing. Like, I find that to be amazing. And it's and, and everybody has their own sort of unique journeys in, of course. into the world. And um, I, I, nobody's going to have that same kind of experience that you are having with this particular play. But I love, I love this story so oh, much. Great. And I mean, calling it a story as if it's a fiction, but I just love the journey that you're on. And I love how the discovery of this play has launched something. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I did not expect the the level of positive reaction. I mean, it, it brings out any number of other insecurities, mm -hmm. you know, because there's there's lots of people who are just like, oh, it's a fluke, and this guy, you know, who 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 is this guy? I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of, in anything in the arts, there's lots of passive aggressiveness you just get from people, and because. I think the number one question everyone is always asking is why not me mm -hmm. whenever they see anything oh, yeah. happening and that's not the way I operate. I really don't I really don't give a shit, man. Mm -hmm. Like I'm really about just telling a, a good story, a story that means something to me. I mean, I've been offered I've been people have reached out to me and tried to con contract me to mm -hmm. to write plays um, for them. And it's not that I'm against the idea of writing a play for someone else. It's just I've got to really be excited about it. It's not a check because if if I'm not excited about it, I'm not gonna. You're not gonna get my best work. Mm -hmm. And and I'm I know myself well enough. That's one of the big benefits of getting started in this in your late 30s and and really kind of picking up steam in your early 40s is that you know yourself a lot better. And every opportunity isn't really the opportunity that other people think it is. That's why I was so thrilled that like when the play ran in Denver that um, Kent Thompson, the artistic director of um, Denver Center, he commissioned me to, to write an original play and it was like when I was telling him my ideas, he's like, that sounds great, do it. And I was mm -hmm. shocked. They're like, you mean I can just write what I want? That was my first commission. So I was really, really stunned by that. And then this play that's going to be read at the Pacific Playwrights Festival, um, I had another play that I'd already written and people were interested in, but then this idea for Little Black Shadows came to me and I just couldn't put it down. So I dropped everything else that I was doing and just spent several months. I mean, I got on a plane, I went down to Louisiana, I just went into full research mode and just threw myself into writing a play that no one asked me for. That at that moment, I just felt like I need to get this written. That's following why, your own inspiration. That's it. And then you, when you have it, you've got a, you know, we've all got bills to pay. I mean, I'm divorced. I've got two kids, so I. It's not. I, I hate the the idea that like if you have responsibilities, you can't. That's bullshit, man. Like, there's what do you really need? Mm -hmm. I, I, I've sat down with a million people and had coffee or had lunch, and I and I tell them exactly what you say. There's no one way. What works for me might not work for you. But I always find it kind of fascinating how people have created these false ceilings for themselves, these false barriers, where I really would love to do this, but, oh, man, I've got so many responsibilities. And it's like, you know, you get up, you get up at 530 in the morning and I'm driving my kid to school and then I come home. Like, you know, you, you, you kind of hear something like that and you know what you're juggling every day. And you go like, do you really... You're you're single. You have three roommates, and you're gonna tell me like about all your awful, awful responsibilities. Right. And I'm just not really hearing it, you yeah. know. So again, the benefit of getting some age on you is that you know what you're really capable of doing when you're when you're passionate about something. And so yeah, so I wrote Little Black Shadows when I was just in this whirlwind of passion for this. And and understand if coming out of one night in Miami, if you would have asked me what would have been the next thing I would have worked on. The last thing I would have expected to say was a story that delved into slavery. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with these black nationalistic type characters. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, that's the last thing. But this story just hit me in a way that... And it comes from a real place, too. What's it's, the story that hit you? 
Um, well, Little Black Shadows, can I talk about what it's uh, about a little sure, bit? It's, sure. It's, it's basically a story. It's set in a plantation in the 1850s in Georgia. And it's honestly just like a family drama about this southern family who are preparing to move further south into Louisiana because the dad who owns the house and owns a plantation, it's a cotton plantation, has an opportunity to take over a sugar plantation in Louisiana. And this causes a lot of stress amongst his kids and his wife. Um, and But the whole story is told from the perspective, is seen from the perspective of the two child slaves. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that often in the antebellum South, a child would have their own personal child slave. And the term that's sometimes used is a little black shadow. So if you have a 10-year-old, your 10-year-old might have a 10-year-old slave. And sometimes that slave just like slept under the bed of your kid at night. And they got up and their only job is to really look after the kids. So the story is told in daytime and nighttime. During the day, you're dealing with this family drama where these child slaves are basically shadows mirror images of the white kids but don't say anything but then at night when they're under the bed there's a separate story that's the only time they can safely communicate with each other and there's so there's an a and a b story and you're hearing the interpretations these children have of what they saw during the day and you're seeing like their worldview based on all this stuff that they're hearing so um it, it came from a few places i mean i uh, you saw the movie 12 Years a Slave? Yes. I thought that was a really good film. But one of the things that I found fascinating was I wish there was like a whole movie in the house of Benedict Cumberbatch, the good slave owner, yeah. who gave him the violin. Right. And there was some politician at the time who said some shit about, um, you know, black Americans. We, they should really be thanking us because, if you know, if not for slavery, they'd have been left in Africa. And, and this is a narrative that I've heard repeated by everyone from politicians to the most ignorant person on the street that slavery wasn't so bad. And then uh, the Federal Writers Project in the 1930s had this awesome project where they sent writers all over the country to document um, in their own words the lives of the last generation of people who had been born into slavery. So the last group of living people who remembered being slaves before they all died. And you could actually, now it's all online, but when I first started researching this play, I went out and bought all the volumes, which were divided up by state. And I got to Georgia and I started reading through it. And what I found shocking was that reading in their own words, the stories of these slaves, how many of them were so thankful that they had good masters. Mm. And there was this kind of genuine, earnest gratefulness to their masters so that even though they're talking about awful, awful things, it's not being spoken about with an, uh, an inch of bitterness. It's being talked about like, man, I've really got it good because that plantation over there, I mean, they beat their slave. They do this, they do that. If a child comes out light skinned, the wife knows and sends it off. But here I've got a good master. So it's about the context. It's not really Stockholm syndrome. No, it's about the, it's, uh, I don't want to give away too much. Mm -hmm. It's, um, the, the final nail in the coffin for me for the story was a very real, um, family mm -hmm. that's tied to one of our greatest presidents. And it's not the one you think, mm -hmm. but if I told you that, then mm -hmm. you would Google it and you'd know too yeah, much. Right. Sure. So it's a work of fiction, but it's based on the, the life of a, a real, mm -hmm. um, a real U S president's, um, family pre presidency. So I just wanted to, I said I wanted to do a, a play about slavery that showed, not, totally not sarcastically, a best case scenario. This family in Little Black Shadows, for all intents and purposes, are liberals mm -hmm. in the context of the South at the this time. time. Yeah. Um, their views, they treat these kids well. Um, <laughs> and that puts people in a very uncomfortable place. And, and I'm not trying to make people uncomfortable. I didn't realize how disturbing it was until I did it and did a reading. And, and you know, it, the reaction was not what I expected. I mean, it, it's, it's a positive reaction, but people were affected in ways that I had not anticipated. Mm -hmm. And again, part of it is my background as a journalist. I'm able to disconnect and be cold and calculating when I'm uncovering information. Mm -hmm. um, I get into the emotion of it, but as I'm kind of researching and as I'm writing it, I, I'm, I have to, I am able to disconnect myself to a, to a certain extent. So then you hear it out loud that first time 
and people don't have the benefit of having spent six months walking around in Louisiana visiting plantation museums and studying the you know the Federal Writers Project. It's mm-hmm. just kind of hitting them, and and it causes a lot of uh, it caused a lot of emotion for some people. But I'm I'm very proud of it. I just again, it's one of those stories that it's it's it can only be done as a play. Mm. And from the moment I came up with the idea, I felt like I'm the only guy who can write this. That's another big component of it. You have to feel like you're the only one that can tell this story in this specific way. That's how I felt about One Night in Miami. That's how I felt feel about Little Black Shadows. Um, that's how I feel about another play that I'm just finishing up my commission. That's another massive departure from these other two. So I feel like I'm all... Uh, I, um, I've always been a student. My my, the next one I'm writing is a contemporary play, but I've I've always been a student of history. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it's just my fascination. But my uh, my fascination with history comes from a bit of a different place because, particularly things like slavery and pre civil rights 1940s things like that. When I tackle those subjects, I'm in the same mind space that one will probably be in when you're watching like dystopian science fiction, <laughs> as opposed to oh my god. All the characters are like, why won't things change? I approach it where the characters, this is just life. Yeah, yeah. And it's only crazy to someone who's not a part of that life, but it's just their life. So, the, so I mean, that's the best comparison I can think of, is I approach history as this, in, with the same, in the same way that you might approach writing dystopian science fiction, in which the characters aren't sitting around bitching about the life that is the life that everyone knows. It's just how they function. And the story within that world might be the main story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the what might be the B story in any other situation is the A story in mine. And that situation is my B story. And by not, I, I feel like sometimes you can make the biggest statement by making no statement. You know? Sure. And that's my attitude with Little Black Shadows. I can make the biggest statement possible about slavery by making no statement about slavery and that's what i tried to do with it have you thought about why uh, the these historical moments have been inspiring you to write plays i'm part of it is that i'm always shocked by how few people know about so much of this stuff like like miami people are like how did you find that out i'm like what do you mean it was it's in this book, that book, that book. It was it was hidden in plain sight. Mm-hmm. And often these little the things that I focus on, these are facts that are always hidden in plain sight. With, well, Miami, I have a better idea of why no one else would maybe tackle it. And, and part of it is that each of those four men became so iconic that, you know, you're a big fan of Malcolm X. You want to write a Malcolm X play. And people try sometimes to do, and I'm very much into slice of life kind of stuff. I mean, One Night in Miami is one unbroken 90-minute scene in real time. So literally no, it's real time transpires for 90 minutes. Um, Little Black Shadows, days go by, but I'm very much into slice of life. Again, a play is not a film. I'm not trying to write an epic that shows Cradle to the Grave. Mm -hmm. And I just, when I come up with, when when I see little bits of history, I often find myself stunned that like Little Black Shadows. When I get to the point where it's like, oh yeah, and at night they sleep under the bed and people go, And I'm like, oh, no, like, that's a real thing. Like, keep in mind, there weren't bathrooms. There was an outhouse. You take a piss or a shit in the middle of the night and fill up your chamber pot. You need that little slave to take it and dump it outside. Take it out to the... If you really think about it and stop thinking about it like a person living in a modern American city, Mm -hmm. that's why it's helpful to do things like go to a few plantations Where's the kitchen? How far is it from the main house? How far are the bathrooms? Where are the servant? Where's the... It's it's not... A, there's No matter how much you read in a book, there's a tactile component to it. That if you're going to write about history, you got to get your ass... You got to pay some money, mm-hmm. get some plane tickets, go meet with some people and really... Or if you don't meet with people, just walk the land and smell the smells and hear the sounds of, of that place. It's just a key... But to me, it's just I'm investing in myself. I mean, that's I'm investing in my own idea being executed as as good as humanly possible. So the Internet, I think, is uh, is a bit of a lie sometimes. And that just because we have so much seemingly everything at our fingertips, sometimes people don't leave the laptop. And a lot of my research is 
in the field, so it's to speak. Tactile, and, right? Yeah, you and learn, I'm a journalist. You so learn differently by being there. Yeah, being a reporter, being a reporter it. means going out into the field. So as a playwright, whether it's history or straight up modern contemporary, part of my process is going out into the field. The writing of my script is about if I had to break up how I write a play, and a hundred percent is concept to the execution of the first draft. I'd say the writing of the actual script is the last 15% hmm. for me. Keep in mind, there's going to be a lot of revisions and rewrites and multiple drafts. But understand, Little Black Shadows, I wrote over like seven months or so. And I had gotten to the point where I had the outline done. Um, but I hadn't written, I'd written the first page of the play. And that's when I pulled together a reading um, I asked some actors I knew. I was like, "Here's the characters you're going to be reading, um, and we're going to do the reading." And this is this is way before it went out. But this is just like part part of my process is also I have to hear the play read aloud because there's just without a single note, just hearing it aloud the first time, a lot of stuff comes to me and a lot of fixes get made. So the first draft isn't even really ready to be shared until it's read aloud. So mm-hmm. you kind of have to make that deal with yourself. Well, fuck it. People are going to have to hear this no matter how bad it is because you need to hear this in order to take it to the next level. So I got some actors together, friends, and and then I announced, uh, told some other friends, like, will you come to a reading of my play? And it was two weeks out. Keep in mind, I'd written one page. Right. So the actors are going to come to my house two days before, the night before the reading. So I had, uh, I think, 12 days to write it. But I had, I, and and that's that's a Kemp thing, yeah. is that if I don't have a fire under my ass, I won't get it done. So I literally wrote between five and ten pages a day. And I finished the draft the night before the actors came by to do a run-through for the reading the next night. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Because it's gonna, it's a, it was a vomit draft, basically. Yeah. And, um, but understand I spent seven months working on it. And the, the the final words that come out of their mouth, that's, that's the thing that's going to be changed the most. You're going to be tweaking dialogue until opening night. Well, in the case of One Night in Miami, you're going to be tweaking that shit until your fourth production. But the structure and the story is, is, is going to stay the same, at least for me. Do you think coming to writing uh, uh, at a relatively o- older age helps sort of strip away that insecurity that you'd have in presenting a, 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 a vomit draft? Well, I, I think one of my strengths as a writer is is character and dialogue. Like, I feel like it's a real strength. Like, I can, I can really churn through. Like, I can have two characters argue for 40 pages if I want to. So it's something that I realized was a, a strength of mine. That's, what I, that's why I had so much fun doing 24-hour play festivals. Because it's like, all right, someone has to kiss, someone has to pull a gun, someone has to do this, it has to take place here, I got three actors, go. Mm-hmm. And I just, bam, 15 pages, you know. So that's not really, but that's not a play. <laughs> you know, it's mm-hmm. the story. What's this about? What's the meaning that it has? Those things that are mining out of it come from all the stuff that's been happening the months before. And, and again, like we did that one reading, um, and then I kind of just made some notes to myself. Some people gave me their feedback. Um, and then I kind of just kind of sat on it for a few months and then did some, then I did slow revisions. So the, the draft that they saw at, um, at South Coast Rep, we did another reading there Mm -hmm. and that's when they decided to do it for, for PPF. Um, you know, I'd had some time to really marinate on it and tweak it. And between then and the actual show, I'm about, I'm just about done with another revision based on the reading that we did then. So I don't want to make it seem like, oh, you spend no time writing. It's just that most of the heavy lift in writing comes after that first read through for me. That's just my personal process. And everyone is so completely different. But it, it has just enough, I guess, motivation. Because again, when someone's not asking you for a play, it's very easy to just let it rot. Because there's always something someone's asking you for that they're paying you for. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? Sure. That's that whole money being a motivator, you got bills to pay, well, this is just my hobby project. But when you announce that you're doing a reading and invite 50 people, you'll get your, instead of going out for some drinks, you're going to get your hobby project done. Mm -hmm. That's all. (laughs) So it's just, it's my own personal motivation. Well, you said earlier that you can't write something unless you are excited. 
right. by it, right? So right. That, need, that component needs to be... Right. And excitement wanes for anything because you get another idea and another idea. So I kind of feel like I need to really dig into things when they're there. Um, there are things that I will go back to, um, like, again, the play that I finished the first draft of and then the second draft of, but this just kind of took its place for right now because I felt it was now was an important time to get it out. So... You what's, know, we'll, the, what's the next thing you're excited about? I'm excited about a few things. I mean, the the commission I am doing for Denver, um, I'm just really gassed about that one. Um, I'm excited about the play that I wrote before Little Black Shadows that's basically the companion piece to One Night in Miami um, called The Two Reds, which um, I'm going to do here in L.A. I'm part of a small playwrights collective called The Temblers that we just started up. And we're going to be at LATC. At LATC, so we're going to be um, producing our plays there. So I'm going to do the Two Reds, which is is basically the. It's not a sequel to One Night in Miami because it takes place 20 years before, but it's in that history vein, and that it's set in Cotton Club Harlem, and it's Malcolm X when he was 19, when he was still Detroit Red, and um, he was a dishwasher mm-hmm. um, in a club, and there was a, he was Detroit Red because there was another redhead dishwasher who was Chicago Red who would one day become Red Fox, the comedian. So it's a 19-year-old Malcolm and a 21-year-old Red Fox as these conch-haired dishwashers in Cotton Club Harlem. So it's a, a real exploration of the, 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 the life of these men pre-civil rights. And I'm really excited about that, too. It's just where are you going to do it? And so when we formed this Playwrights Collective, this seemed like the perfect place to kind of um, do that production. And in the the play I'm doing for for Denver, it's called Kristen McAuliffe's um, Eyes Were Blue, and it's it's the first play I've written actually that kind of tackles the life of my childhood, 1980s Brooklyn. It's set in the days leading up to the Challenger disaster, mm. um, in and around a, a junior high school in South Brooklyn, um, and it and it deals with these two um, these two twin brothers who have very different groups of friends. Um, I, I'm trying not to give away a, too much, but let's just say they're twins, but they're different races. Mm-hmm. And because of that, set in the world of '80s Brooklyn, that means they're on they're on opposite sides of an ongoing conflict at their junior high school. Mm. It's uh, I got I got a little bit of a tingle when you said that because we're <laughs> we're we're about the same age. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I grew up in New Hampshire, where Chris McAuliffe is from. Oh wow! And I have a lot of uh, really dramatic memories for uh, having my science teacher in junior high school being BFFs with Krista McAuliffe. So the lead up to the Challenger was a big deal in my school, in all schools. In all schools watched it. <laughs> in particularly in New Hampshire, because sure. New Hampshire is New Hampshire, and what is that? Right. And here's one of our own being shot up into space and uh it was one of those another seminal event from my childhood that i remember so much stuff and and it was it was supposed to be this inspirational moment that turned into like a moment of horror and heartbreak Mm -hmm. heartbreak is the biggest emotion for so many people because i mean people had their classrooms watching it and there were science that one of my characters in the play is a science teacher who had applied for and wanted to be that teacher Mm. so it's a very Again, a uh, dramatic departure from the, I guess technically it's historic and that it's the 80s, but I, f- I view it as a contemporary play because it also takes place in 2013, showing the fallout of several of those characters who, <laughs> who cross each other as adults. So it mm-hmm. jumps back and forth in time between 19, the 1980s and 2013 with the same characters playing themselves as adults and children. So, you know, when it inspires you, you just kind of... Kemp, I gotta say, I have about a thousand more <laughs> questions. There's so much. Maybe I need to do like six a uh, six episode uh, series with you, and maybe uh, maybe I'll be able to to bring you back because I'm I'm utterly fascinated by uh, what you've talked about and by what you haven't talked about. <laughs> you know, sometimes you say a lot by not saying anything, right? Sure. Um, but thank you for doing this. My pleasure. I know you have to go. You've right, got a right. day job. Yep, yep. And um, we will hopefully talk more on the record or off the record. That sounds great. Later. That sounds great, dude. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, bye. All right, let's not waste any time and jump right into my conversation with Eliza Clark. Her play Future Thinking is playing at South Coast through the end of April. I know Ari because just because I Ari is you know an LA theater mm-hmm. legend, 
and uh, he worked on my thesis play in grad school. Really? Yeah, when I was in grad school, I had uh, I wrote this part, and when I was writing it, I was like, oh man, it would be amazing if I could get Ari Gross to do this. And uh, and then I get to the end of my I went to USC for uh-huh. grad school, and and I was just like, can we get Ari? I think Ari's available, and he totally was, and he did it. He's so amazing. He's also like such a generous collaborator too. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. He. Yeah. I mean, the time we spent in rehearsal, he provided so oh. many sort of like anecdotes from his life yeah. that literally inspired rewrites in the play. Me too. Yeah. I like. My director keeps telling me to stop telling people that Ari co-wrote the play because he didn't actually. <laughs> but like, um, but he is amazing, and he did write the best joke in the play. Or it's the latest oh, really? joke, so I feel yes, he did. Because I was give, and it was for for another actor. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, it was fun. I was trying. There's like a phone call sequence in the play, mm-hmm. and um, Ari's character is being held hostage basically by the security guard, and uh, and at the top of Act Two, he's decided he's going to call his lawyer sister, and then the security guard gets on the phone with her, and I was like, I think it would be good if. We amp up. I wrote this in previews. This part, not not the the scene was always there, and they were always talking on the phone, but just like added some stuff to it. Where Enver, who's playing the security guard, was uh, was doing this thing where he was sort of being really friendly with the sister on the phone, and so I wanted to kind of like mine that a little bit more. And so I was saying, you know, all right, let's add the line like, "Where are you calling from?" And then say like, "Well, it's you know, oh, that must be nice this time of year." And Ari said, or you could say, well, aloha. <laughs> and it's amazing. People die. It's so funny. <laughs> so she's great. like in Hawaii getting a call from her brother. It's just very funny. Well, let's actually, since we're on this already, let's mm-hmm. take a step back. And why don't uh, you give us a little bit of context about what the hell we're talking about right now? Oh, my play? Right. Are we on? We're on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Uh, my play is called Future Thinking, and it's about a like middle-aged pet photographer from Ohio who's a super fan of this fictional television show called Odyssey and he it takes place at Comic-Con and um, at the opening of the play he's in this kind of annex space in the hotel that the uh, security guard is holding him there because he's violated a restraining order that a young actress has against him Last year, he brought her a vial of his blood. This year, he's brought her a <laughs> ring. And uh, and so you go between the security guard and this super fan slash stalker to the, um, the girl, the 23-year-old actress and her momager and her bodyguard. And mm-hmm. you kind of go back and forth between those two worlds. And then eventually they meet. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I think you kind of know that that's going to happen, but anyway. You figure. Yeah. I've seen, uh, I haven't seen the play yet, but I've seen production photos, yeah. and I have to say uh, Ari's costume. Yeah, it's is, pretty amazing, It's right? pretty fantastic. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so where did the play, what inspired, what inspired the play? Um, I was a child actor, um, so. Uh, so I know. I I uh, I was very familiar with uh, some of your work and your name, but I didn't know your backstory. Uh-huh. So when somebody said you're you're going to be interviewing um, Eliza Clark, I was like, oh, I I know that person. But then I did I you know I did a little bit of research. I'm very okay. lazy, so yeah. I don't do that much. <laughs> but but the research that I did led with former child actor. Yeah. And I, I, and well, I, that's funny because I mean. I, it's not like I was very successful, but my brother is all, was also a child actor, and he is still an actor, and he was a successful child actor who, like, was the kid in Gladiator mm-hmm. and the kid in Unbreakable, and mm-hmm. et cetera. Um, right. He's a very talented actor. I am uh, – <laughs> I'm sorry that I feel like I – okay, anyway. Um, uh, I was in Les Miserables mm-hmm. when I was nine on Broadway. And that is my crowning achievement. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a, I mean, that's a pretty damn good achievement. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. It For is, somebody who wasn't successful. It's true. I also, I actually, they, one girl, um, they have three girls and two boys who play the parts and they kind of rotate them. 
Um, and I, one of the girls is the understudy for Gavroche, which is the boys' part. And I got I was the understudy for Gavroche, and I got to go on twice as Gavroche. Ooh. So that's pretty cool. And how no. old were you at the time? Nine. And you were growing up in New York? Uh-huh. Well, Connecticut. Okay. But um, so so yeah, so I was a child actor, and so this is about a child actor. This play, and I've tried to write about my experiences in that multiple times. I tried to write this play a few years ago that was called Dead Children, that was about a um, little kid who sees ghosts in the style of like there. There's a lot of reality shows on TV that are about like kid psychics. And it was about that. It was like about a kid psychic who basically has like a stage mom, but but it's not. You know. Anyway, it, that sounds like a good premise, but it was a terrible play. And <laughs> Dude, I, the idea of kids like I like I have no yeah. idea that these things. Oh that yeah, there's this like is a real thing. Shows. I'm so disconnected from yeah. pop culture, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That I find this completely amazing. It is amazing. Well, I'll, I was trying. You know, I just thought it would be funny. The mom. You know, because like little kids are creepy. Like my son, my son is eight, 19 months old, and he has a weird closet in his room that's not really a closet. It's like a crawl space that like is like an attic space, and we just kind of put stuff in front of it because there's we don't need that storage. But one time he like recently last week he pointed at the closet and said, oh, "People, no. oh no!" So like, oh, no. but you know, he's also just like <laughs> trying out words. I'm sure he's not saying. Go- he also says ghost all the time. I don't think he knows what a ghost is. Are you raising a child psychic? No. Maybe. I mean, maybe. There are people that believe in that stuff and believe that children are, like, sort of more uh, in tune with the other dimensions. In my mind, it's like he's trying out language. He's heard us say those words. like, And the fact that he pointed at the closet means nothing. But I thought it would be funny to kind of mine the idea of, like, a mom who's like, oh, okay, people? like, And then, like, sort of creates it was sort you know a little bit like the Salem witch trials like draw it out of a kid you I feel like you could make a kid believe they're seeing ghosts when they're not sure for like fame purposes so that was what that play was like trying to be and as I'm talking about it I'm like hmm, that's kind of a good idea maybe I should write that again yeah. it was not good um but I so I've been trying to kind of write about my experiences in that world for a long time and my experiences were largely positive mm-hmm. um you know i think it's hard for any kid to be a professional when they're a child um and i have all sorts of like weird hang-ups including that i don't like to be recorded <laughs> oh great <laughs> well meaning that like i you know i always knew from the time i was like five or six years old i knew that like you know what you say can be held against you <laughs> So you learned that from a young age. Totally. Did, well, you learn you like learn how to be, be professional. Did basically. you learn it because you fucked up and something bit you in the ass? Um. Well, yeah. I. Is it something you can't say now? No, no, no. I just don't want. You know, I. My mother was not a stage mom. Like she was great, and it was one of the things that we did among many things that we did. But you know, it was like I was uh, in this off-Broadway play when I was six and I was the lead in this musical and um, you know I had an understudy who was a little bit older than I was and then the producer's daughter was like a little bit younger than I was and I one time said to the producer's daughter like you can't play with us because I wanted the my understudy to like me mm-hmm. my mom was like you know you can't talk to her that way I it might not have been my mom somebody might have said like you know that's the producer's daughter right. <laughs> So I have, which is terrible. But, I mean, I should have been nice to her, but I was six. Right. I mean, you don't, you don't know. You're, no, of course not. Right. Yeah. So this. So so let's let's follow the 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 child actor thread. Yeah. And I want to see how that connects to the adult writer thread. Well, that play, that off Broadway play that I did, um, was about a little girl. Uh, it was a true story. Or based on a true story about this little girl who was shipwrecked off the coast of Oregon in 1905 and who claimed to be a French princess and also, I think, was a genius. And so she wrote this diary that was, um, it, it's a, you know, you could, it's like you can buy it at stores, mm-hmm. bookstores. Um, her name was Opal Whiteley and she, um, she wrote this diary and, you know, she named – she was taken to this, uh, like, lumber camp and 
made to live with this woman who wasn't very nice to her. And then they sort of, over the course of the play, like, they sort of, she kind of makes life in this camp better for all these people. Um, but she, you know, names all the animals after, you know, she has a mouse named Felix Mendelssohn and a tree that she calls Michelangelo and a pig that's her, like, best friend named Peter Paul Rubens. And so, like, you know, because she's sort of a genius. And I started writing, a, I started keeping a journal when I was in the play. Because your character... Well, not, I mean, yes, because I'm very method. No, but yes, because I was like, no, but you, you were, I sort okay. of like wanted to be her. Yeah. Um, you know, and I didn't know I was acting. It's like, I mean, I knew, but like when you're a kid actor, I was a good kid actor because being a kid actor is just about um, being natural. Whereas like being an actor is a whole different thing that mm-hmm. I'm not good at, but I could sort of play a version of myself and sort of, and and make it seem real. <laughs> do, you, do you recall what you were aware of at the time of, you know, being six years old in a play? Were you just following directions or were you no, actually conscious like really, of what's happening? No, I was totally conscious of what was I mean, I, I had never sung before. I sang um, multiple songs in the play. I was like, I really felt like I was acting. I was like, you know, I was a little, I was also the only kid in this show, all adults, and they were all so sweet. And it was so much fun. I loved it. It was amazing. But, like, this little girl, um, like, so during that time, I would, like, write letters to myself from God and then, like, hide them places backstage. And then like, it would be like, dear dear Eliza, break a leg, love God. <laughs> and um, <laughs> then for, you, the, for other people to discover yes, or for you? Yes, for other people to discover so that they could be like, wow, Eliza, God wow. wrote you a note. <laughs> And I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> I was just like, you know, an imaginative right. little weirdo. Uh, but I started keeping a journal. And because this character was French, she has this way of writing that is, you know, she spoke English, but she has a way of writing in English that is sort of incorrect. Like she'll say, she would say like, I I did go to the tree to see the pig or whatever. And so I started writing in that way Mm -hmm. in my own journal so if like you read my journal from that time which is like all about jelly beans and like sleepovers right um, the important things the important things that's actually still what my journals are about (laughs) um she uh you know i think it was like the first time i was trying out um you know, writing in someone else's voice, which has always been what I'm interested in and continued to be what I was interested in. Like, I don't, I think I intuitively understand English grammar, but I couldn't tell you how to write a sentence correctly. I can only, like, feel it. And I use punctuation like a crazy person Mm -hmm. um, because I only care about the way people speak. I don't care about um, correct writing correctly. That's great. The way I describe it from my own writing is I use punctuation like a person that doesn't understand how to use punctuation. Yes, of course. Yes. Totally. And on my TV show, the on many of the TV shows that I've worked on, my you know, my boss will be like, "This is inconsistent." And I'm like, "You can't understand like, come on. Like, no, it's two dashes this time. It's one dash next time, and it's an ellipsis. Like, mm-hmm. those, you can't understand the difference between those." And they're like, "Yeah, but isn't it this? I mean, aren't you sort of?" I'm like, "You know, just feel it out. That's right. how I write." So I have to make them consistent anyway. Um, yeah. So the play, <laughs> the play is about that, and then it's also about um, being a parent a little bit. I just brought it back to something we were talking about 20 minutes ago. Back to future no thinking. <laughs> uh, that's fine. I'm in charge here, though. Okay, so let sorry. Me, no, I'm sorry. kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm curious about your entree into acting when you were a kid. So mm-hmm. uh, were you? do you remember uh, being a child and not acting and yearning for that? Or were your parents like, here's the thing, Eliza, and I don't remember your brother's name. Spencer. Spencer, uh, here's a thing that we think you guys will enjoy doing. Well, I did my first commercial when I was six months old. Okay. So, and you were like, "Please, can I yeah, go I was like, on this?" Call? I have a dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my mom is a figure skating coach. She's like a really um, amazing athlete, mm-hmm. and uh, my parents have been married. I mean, my parents have been together since they were fourteen, and they made a wow. pro- yeah, and they're like totally in love. It's very sweet. Um, they 
my dad made my mother promise that we wouldn't be skaters because my mom is so good that she could have like you know she could have made us she could have like you know from day one had it us yeah figure skaters right my dad didn't want that and he didn't want that for me like especially for a girl like all that pressure so instead i did acting where there's no pressure there's no pressure yeah there's no like body image issues or anything like that um she was really she's and she's like a very um my mother is like a very determined person and a ambitious person and um she's like a really disciplined person and she was working all the time when i was a baby and she had a student who had done some commercials or something who said like you should do this with eliza by the way everyone calls me eli i don't know so i'm calling myself eliza because because Anyways, because I called you, you Eliza. Are. Well, that, I actually I, w- I had that curiosity because you sign your emails. Yeah. And I wasn't sure how to pronounce oh, yeah. E L I, yeah. and so I was just like, yeah. I actually yeah. emailed a friend. Did you? And said, "What does she go by?" Really? <laughs> yes. And what did the friend say? Uh, professionally, it's Eliza. Who told you this? Who was the friend? I'll tell you off the air. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, what else did that person say about me? <laughs> oh, let me tell you. Hold on. I have it all written here. <laughs> um, so I think my mom, I think for my mom it was like, okay, if I'm not going to be training people 18 hours a day and I want to spend time with my kid, but I want to do it in a way. Like, I don't think she could have been a stay-at-home mom in, uh, in like, a traditional sense, mm-hmm. which I now, being a mother – like really understand I mean I think it is for some people but it's not Mm -hmm. for me and it wasn't for her and so but she also you know my parents couldn't afford childcare that much you know they couldn't have afforded like a nanny and I think my mom was like okay well this will be fun also my parents had you know my mother my mother's one of five and my dad is one of seven and they you know so they didn't have a lot of like financial help when they were, you know, young married people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure they had some, but they uh I think it was a way to be like, here's a cool opportunity. Here's something that we can do together. Like this this maybe will have let us do some traveling, which we got to do, you know, that we would maybe not have gotten to do. Do you think do you think uh you're the type of parent you are because of your parents? Totally. Because I have some friends who are parents who yeah. are who they are as parents because of their parents, but mm-hmm. they, the, they've intentionally they, gone in the opposite direction. No, my parents are great. I feel like I, uh, you know, I don't think I will um, let my child be a child actor, but they did it, I think, the best way it can be done. I just think it's, like, kind of a toxic environment. Although I'm super glad I did it because it's totally made me who I, I am and, mm-hmm. like, brought me into this business and made me you know there's a lot of amazing things I've gotten from it but like you know I hate myself because of it (laughs) not really but sort of well uh, I'm curious I'm curious about that well like when you're 11 and you're in a show right and you're the dresser who's dressing you says oh somebody's been eating some cookies like shit like that it's like you know, that's, like... T- I mean, and that can happen in any environment, but, like, it's just sort of toxic. The acting is sort So of when toxic. somebody is saying that to you at age 11... Yeah. Is the 11-year-old you going, oh, come on? Or is it, in retrospect, you look back and you're like, wait a second, I was 11 years old and they're commenting on my... The 11-year-old is going... Is, like, turning beet red and feeling shame. Right. And, like, the 30-year-old is, like, feeling anger. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Because, like, you know, when you're 11 and you're – I mean, I, wa- I was adorable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I actually went through a really super awkward chubby phase. But, like, I was just a kid. You know, you grow out of that. You grow into it. You grow out of it. It's like, you know, and when you're not – when you're not in a public um, – when you're not, like, on stage being looked at, it's okay. Right. Or it's, I mean, I you know, who knows? It's like – probably pretty terrible for all girls in all walks of life but it was just hard for me at the time and I feel like 
it has like it still has like wormed its way into my brain. Do you even think? Now. Do you think those experiences um, motivated you to shift away from from acting, or was there something else that sort of like sent you on a different trajectory? Um. Well, when I was in tenth grade, I went to boarding school, and which I begged my you know I really wanted to go, and. That was sort of a ending point of professional acting. I had done like a Law and Order mm-hmm. the year before, and done like a little bit of stuff. And then I was like, I want to go to high school, an hour and a half from home, which is like two hours from the city. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I think it was like an unconscious break. From that. So you weren't like, I got to get away from this? No, no, not at all. I totally thought I was going to be an actor. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I got to high school, I did um, I did some acting. I was, you know, like I did Guys and Dolls and I did, I was Stella in Streetcar Ma- Named Desire. Mm-hmm. And actually Streetcar was the first time I felt like I was actually acting because really child acting is so different from real acting. Um and it was the first time I was, like, thinking about a character and thinking about creating a character that was not a version of me. and um, Getting inside the skin of another totally. person. And it was really hard and really exciting. But I wasn't that good at it. You know, I – you know, it's, I – my brother is um, amazing. Like, he – it's sort of like an – he go, can go to a place that I can't go to. Um and I think just people have different ways into their, their, you know, their their empathy or their, you know, I don't even know what to call it, but just like to tap into their creative potential. And I, acting is not my way. I had a I had a similar experience. I I, I essentially spent my my twenty. I was never into theater or mm-hmm. acting or anything until after college. Oh, really? As I was trying to figure out what to do with my life, and I spent my essentially my 20s doing various forms of, of performing and acting. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember distinctly doing uh, this play by Israel Horovitz called, it's called The Sugar Plum. Uh-huh. And it was his, like one of his very first plays that he wrote in the in the 60s, as I understand it. And uh, I remember, and it's a two-hander, and I remember being in the play and uh, having my lines memorized, and I'm I have the blocking and I'm speaking my lines and I remember during a performance I'm doing the things I need to be doing but uh-huh. in my head I'm also saying I have no idea what this play is about That's I have hilarious. no idea what I'm doing <laughs> I'm go I have to pick up the newspaper and cut <laughs> and grab the scissors now because I need to make a hat to put my character needs to put this paper, like newspaper hat on, but I have no idea why. I'm just doing it because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's kind of amazing, though. And it it yeah. was like I should not be doing this. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and I I just shortly thereafter got out of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, watching real actors, like working with the actors that are in my play right now, it's like who are so good across the board, and. You know, like Virginia Vale, who plays the um, the actress, mm-hmm. she'll she's so open to the work. She's there's she's like a live wire. I mean, as a person, she's like a delightful, beautiful, like friendly sweetheart. And in addition to that, she's just so open to to the world that she like will be talking about. There's a part of the play where they are. Um, where she and the uh, fan kind of reenact a scene from the television show. Mm -hmm. And it's really stupid. Like, the television show is bad. It's bad writing. But in rehearsal, we're talking about... But it's a... I think it's a pretty profound moment in the play. But the... But... But it, there's this level where you're li- where you're listening to it and you're like, these people are so into this, but, like, it's so bad. And... They're talking about, you know, like the lines are like, is this rock even worth fighting for and all this stuff? And Lila, the director, <laughs> who's one of my best friends from college, um, is talking to Virginia about this and saying, you know, I think that this character, your character and the 
and his character are, you know, he found her when she was an orphan, when she was just a baby, and he raised her, and he, like, is her father figure, and Virginia, like, starts crying. Because it means something to her, because she's, like, op- she's, you know, which is why she's so amazing, but, like, why I could never... I'm, like, too embarrassed and self-conscious and whatever. She's just amazing. They're mm-hmm. all amazing. Uh, Is that so, a good story? I, I was elliptical and I stopped. No, it's a great story. It's a great story. <laughs> And it's and it's not it, a great story. <laughs> it is. It's I th- I find it fascinating, okay. and I love I love when you yeah. connect with actors who are yeah. connecting with your work because it's so it's so inspiring. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And from and and I empathize with you because yeah. I experience actors in a similar way where yeah. I am a, I am just in awe of what yeah. they're able to do because I can't do it. I live sort of surreptitiously behind the scenes of my own yeah. fictitious characters yeah. who are all me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amazing. So, okay, so go back. I want to I want to know what the I want the, I want to know about the motivation to be, begin writing drama, how that started. Um well, so in high school I wrote this my first play was called Talk of Pleasant Things. And it was, I've been reading a lot of Eugene O'Neill. And so I wrote, like, my version of a Eugene O'Neill play, which was, like, this terrible thing that was about, like, homelessness and AIDS and alcoholism and drug abuse, and dysfunctional families, mm-hmm. and, like, um, just so bad. But I directed it at school. It's also why I never had a boyfriend. <laughs> um, it's like, I directed it. We staged it. It was amazing. I mean, the play was terrible. But the experience was amazing. The experience was amazing. And I think I just got um, hooked into writing. And I mean, I was also like, you know, reading a lot and really like just loving um, words. That's a stupid thing to say, but it's true. And like, and when I went to college, I actually sort of write a, I, I, you know, I think my writing lives in a comedic space. Mm-hmm. Although I've never written like a television comedy, I have written one. Like I wrote a pilot that was a television comedy, but I have never written for a comedy. I've only written on like shows like The Killing, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, which is not a comedy. Not particularly funny. There are funny moments, sure. but yeah, but they're few and far between. It's mostly about murder. Um, yeah, but I, I think that I sort of ended up in drama because that was my first job in television. Uh, so you wrote that play in high school and you directed mm-hmm. it and you're now you say it was pretty terrible at the t- at the time where you were like this is really good oh yeah I was like wow I am and did you think good at writing <laughs> so, so so but that's fine I mean yeah, we all yeah. are so hopefully thinking yeah. that and that's yeah. you wrote that and you're like oh this is I can do this yeah. I have an aptitude for this and so that sent, is that the thing that sent you to continue writing yes plays? I mean I also in college I directed a lot of plays um, which I also really loved. I'm pretty bossy, mm-hmm. so I enjoyed being in charge. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I and then I went to Yale, and they have this thing called the Playwrights Festival, which is like you know anyone who wants to can submit a play, and then five plays get chosen, and you get paired with two mentors: one who is like an inside Yale mentor, who's like a professor or like a drama student and then an outside Yale uh, outside Yale mentor who's like a New York playwright and so I my sophomore year wrote a play and got into that festival and then did it every year after that Mm -hmm. um, and got to work with my first the first play that I wrote for that was like the first play that I think was actually pretty good although still terrible um, but we did that play in the Fringe Festival. And actually, my the director of the play that's at South Coast right now um, was in that play. I directed it. Oh, really? She was in it, yeah. Oh. Uh, but uh, my, my mentor for that play was Rollin Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, I, it was this play that was about a young widow, like a girl in her mid-20s whose husband got 
hit by a car. And she goes back to be with her parents. And then the parents are versions of my parents. And then there are these. And then there was a chorus of people who were sort of like acting out scenes from her life. And Rollin said to me, uh, you should make this chorus that was like four women and four men. He was like, you should make it one woman and one man playing all the parts because otherwise no one will ever produce it. And I was like, produce it? Like, <laughs> what are you talking? Like, he was the f- he really treated me like I was um, a real writer. And I wasn't, but I was like, oh, that's, a- and, you know, I just, that was like, oh, this is a real possibility for me. I mean, and I've talked to him since. I don't know that he totally remembers that, but, um, you know, I wonder if he was just being nice. He probably was at the time, but... He says that to everybody. He does. He's always like, <laughs> they'll never produce this. <laughs> um, yeah, and so he he was a really encouraging person, and then I worked, and then I took a class with Donald Margulies, who um, was so great, and, like, really, um, you know, he told... He... I wrote Edgewise, which was my first... New York production um, for his class. And that play is actually my first good play. And that play is still sometimes used as a sample for television work that I get, mm-hmm. which embarrasses me because I don't think it's that good anymore because I wrote it 10 years ago. But um, but I mean, it, it, it's, it's all to say that like I wrote that for his class and it was exciting. It got me an agent, all these things. But he said to me, Um, you know, don't keep writing this play. Don't, like, keep editing this. Like, move on. Write your next thing. You'll get Mm -hmm. better as you write. And I remember at the time feeling like, like, he doesn't like the play. I was like, oh, he doesn't like this because he's saying, like, let go of this one. Mm -hmm. Um, But actually what he was saying was, like, keep going. Get better. You know, it was just it. He and you'll he get was, better by getting on to the next thing and totally. working on that, not circling and circling and circling. Yeah, don't don't be like excited that you wrote something that you're excited about and just keep, you know, mm-hmm. tweaking that forever. Like keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was great advice. And you know, he was he was really kind to me. You know, he had he. I think he told South Coast about me, um, which is very sweet of him. He's a sweet man. Um, he works out in a gym with my grandmother. <laughs> that's kind of brilliant. Yeah, it's um, pretty funny. Yeah, I love that your grandmother is going to the gym. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's amazing. Is there something uh, you know you're you're still relatively young? I mean, mm-hmm. especially from from my perspective, I'm 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 old compared oh, to yeah. you. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but do you so far in your in your body of work, do you uh-huh. see something? Do you see threads that's themes that um, maybe connect them all? Do you see something that you keep coming back to? I used to, like in my early stuff, and my early stuff, I've only written like three real plays, so I don't know why I'm saying my early stuff. That's my two earlier earlier mm-hmm. plays. Um, those plays were about fear and terror and what that does to people. Um, and I was writing them from a place of fear and terror. You know, Edgewise was sort of a post-9-11 play mm-hmm. that's about um, three teenagers working at a fast food restaurant in New Jersey while World War III is taking place in New Jersey and um, and all over the world. But, like, there's an airstrike and bombs go off and a guy stumbles in bloody and they don't know if he's on their side or the enemy side, so they tie him up and torture him. But it's funny. Um, It sounds hilarious. Yeah, it's not that funny, but there are funny parts. They're like stoners, and um, it's sort of like a teen, you know, there's like teenage drama amidst this violence. Um, And that was sort of about, that was me sort of dealing with some serious anxiety. And like, I mean, I was like a crazy person. Um, And my other play, Recall, is about um, a world where, Teenagers who show signs of sociopathy are kind of taken out of society and destroyed. And like a little, a 13 year old psychopath and her mother on the run. Those two plays, I think, are in conversation with one another. Um, and they're about like what kids are capable of. 
this play is totally new for me and really exciting for me for that reason. It's like I feel like it's about people more than the other plays were. The other plays were like worlds um, and they had this kind of sci-fi element that was enjoyable and fun to write and I like those plays but this play is a little bit more I feel more exposed by this play because it's like there's nothing to hide there's no like fancy um idea to hide behind it's Mm -hmm. like just people being people and dealing with each other and you know but it still involves sci-fi but in a cursory way that's true it's so weird it's i'm not like that sci. i'm anyway but there's something about sci-fi right i do like it yeah i like i yeah i guess it's i mean i like post-apocalyptic right (laughs) um yeah i don't know you wrote for rubicon right yeah that's where i met my husband Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. What was he doing on the show? He was a writer. We oh. were both writers. Yeah, Rubicon was my first job. How did you get that job? Um, as a, as the lame, it's such a lame question. I mean, I threw my agent. <laughs> right. I know, it's I just so it, stupid. I'd never written a television show, though, and I never, I didn't even have, like, a spec script. So the showrunner of that show, Henry Brumell, like, really took a chance on me. Um which was very sweet of him. And it's kind of, I mean, I love these, yeah. I love these sort of like life moments. Yeah. You know, you had this showrunner take a chance on you. Yeah. And what happened was you met the love of your life. Yeah. You, I'm calling him the love of your life. Yeah. <laughs> for you, for well, you. hopefully, right. Uh, <laughs> and you're married with a child now. Uh-huh. And another writer on the show was our officiant at our wedding. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so it amazing. was a very close-knit group of people. That show, um, you know, ended up, sort of not succeeding really but it was um really fun to work on it was an amazing group of people Mm -hmm. like you know obviously my husband is awesome (laughs) that's what i hear yeah do you you. hear that yeah from me yeah yeah other Other people would probably say it too what, what are you what are you aspiring for at this point in your career um you know i Doing this play has really made me miss theater and want to do more of that. And I'd love to have a show on television that's my show. Mm-hmm. That would be good. That would be a good feeling. So, have you Have you written anything for your brother? My brother is going to be on the show that I am currently writing for. Really? Mm-hmm. And what show is that? It's called Animal Kingdom, okay. and it's going to be on TNT in June. Um, yeah. It's so exciting. That's really exciting. Yeah, he has, like, a very cool arc on the show. And I, uh, uh, you know, on TV, it's actually, you know, people could be, like, nepotism or whatever. But it's actually, like, so much harder to get a job when your, like, sister's a writer on the show. If I were the executive producer, I would be like, you just give my brother the job. But actually, it's like, when he came into audition, I had to be like, so just, like... Full disclosure, guys, this is my brother. And I think, like, everybody goes, like, oh, God. You know? I mean, Did you did you consider not saying that? I think just... that would have been really, really um, bad. Really? Yeah, because I think that they would have been, like, what the hell? <laughs> why didn't you, why didn't you yeah. say something? Yeah. Because it's not, what if you he was... You pulled one over on him. Well, also, like, what if he was terrible, and then he left the room, and they were, like, oh, he was bad. Or, right. You know, like, and then I, I was, like, that's my brother. You know, right. I think that, that it would have been... to be related to that guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I had to tell them. But I actually think he really, you know... It was he had to win the part, which he did. It's going to be very exciting. I'm super excited about it. And what's the show about? It's based on the Australian movie Animal Kingdom, which is about um, like a family of bank robbers. And um, the movie is beautiful. It takes place in Australia. This is a family in like in Oceanside, California, but it has the same kind of gritty naturalism realism that the movie has it's cool it's like it's bank robbers but it's not oceans 11 it's like family drama um real people when when they do heists it's like how would a real person do a heist it's Mm -hmm. very cool it's very i'm having a great time and it's an amazing group of writers are there other playwrights in the room there are there's one aton frankel Mm -hmm. um who also writes for shameless Mm -hmm. and yeah He's a playwright. And and Jonathan Lisko, who created the show, is, um, you know, came from being a playwright. But he hasn't written a play in a while. He wants to write a play. <laughs> um, 
yeah, it's a great, it's a very small group, but a great group. And, you know, that make that makes such a big difference on TV. So, so future, your experience with uh, future thinking has you thinking about the future, the future of theater. of theater and your own place in it. Do you have other, do you have other plays in your head? I do have two plays that I'm working on right now that I'm excited about. Can you share? I feel like I shouldn't because it'll make them bad. You know, it's like, I also, it's such a different way of writing. You know, in television, like, you break the story with the team and, Mm -hmm. like, you know every single beat going into it and you're kind of like, if there's any discovery in the writing, that's a bonus, but it's often not the case. And then in, and so in theater, I'll, like, start with a seed. Like, I don't know how you write plays, but, like, for me, Mm -hmm. I'll just, like, start with a character. And oftentimes when I get to the end of it, I'm like, oh, well, I didn't need those 40 pages in the beginning. Um, but so I, do, I have seeds. I don't have like I, I don't know what they're about yet. What are the types of things that um, catch your attention? OK, fine. You're going to make me talk about it. OK. <laughs> uh, no, you I do not have to, to talk about I it. I went to I'm just kidding. I went to um, Joshua Tree recently with a group of my friends and we went to the Integratron, which is like this big. Have you ever been? No. Oh my god, it's the goofiest. It muscle. sounds amazing. It's hilarious and amazing. It's like this big dome building that um, has no. I guess I don't. I don't really remember because I was like pretty hungover when the guy was telling us. But it was like there's no like nails or something. It's like the the sound quality is amazing and so the the um, what is the word? I'm the acoustics mm-hmm. are apparently like unparalleled and it's like sitting on some i mean the guy so they they there's like a man i mean i'm sure there are women too but like you go up this ladder and then you lie on the floor with like 30 other people and that and you close your eyes and this man plays these bowls Mm -hmm. and it's like you meditate for an hour i'm not the kind of person that does stuff like this but it was amazing he also this man was like this is the site of an alien landing. Of course like, it is. And he's, like, talking about it, like, obviously it was an alien land. Like, he, there's no, there's no, like, legend has it. It's like, right. this this is where aliens Fact. landed. Yeah. Fact. Amazing. <laughs> and then the experience is, like, pretty cool. So I, you know, and the building is two stories, so I have an idea for a play that, like, takes place in the bottom level, like the lobby of the Integratron. That's just, like, a cool location and I think I have some cool characters to put there and I think it'll be fun on stage for like people to like go up a ladder and disappear and then you hear like that's what the bulls sound like so I guess at at the heart at the heart of my at the heart of my question is me trying to figure out uh, to learn about and I like to ask that kind of question of yeah. of everybody to find out the types of things that inspire you to write and whether it comes from a philosophical idea, mm-hmm. an emotional mm-hmm. yearning, um, an image. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you had this feeling in this weird place. And that's the that's the trigger for you is, is going it, to this place that's yeah. weird and you're like, oh, I think there might be a story here. Yeah, I think it depends for me. It's, like, really different every time. I used to come at it from a philosophical place. I mean, I think that Recall and Edgewise, those two plays, are were, like, what would happen if uh, kids... Like, I was reading about sociopaths. Like, or I read, you know, in, with Edgewise, I read an article about um, these teenagers who beat up... Um, I think it was like they like did this her- in the Bronx. It was like this horrific hate crime of like a gay kid in their high school. And I was reading it and it was like 10 kids or something like almost killed this other kid. And I was thinking about how there's probably a sociopath or two in that bunch. You know, there's probably just mm-hmm. like a kid who like wants to fucking kill somebody. Sorry, can I swear? Yeah. Okay. Fuck yeah. Um, fuck yeah. Uh, but then there are the other kids who just don't know how to say no and don't know how to, like, stand up for themselves. I mean, I certainly don't think I would have been a part of something like that in high school. Certainly not. Cause that, but I do think there are ways in which 
you start to like your morality starts to corrode when you are afraid or when you are under the influence of other people. Anyway, so that's where the seed of that, that you know, came out of an article. It came out of my feelings about 9-11. It came out of like all of that. And then uh, I think – but since then, I feel like I'm telling more stories that come out of character and just like thinking of an interesting person and an interesting dilemma for them. But, like another I, – I, articles sometimes are – the seat. I don't know, you know. But so you read an article and and I, I make that sound like I read a lot of articles, but I'm like really not up to date on anything. So you you <laughs> I you, read one you article. Obsessively read the New Yorker <laughs> cover to read... cover every week. I get it. Yeah, I really don't. I really don't. In fact, like people will send me one article and and they'll be like, "You read this article?" And I'm like, "They're like, you probably read this because you probably read the New Yorker." I'm like, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. I did not read this, but thank you for sending it. And now I'll write a play about it. Like and everybody be else, like, I read this in the New Yorker. Right. <laughs> Like everybody else, I have the New Yorker. Yes, exactly. I have the New Yorker. They pile up. Right. I read the article long enough to know what it's about. Yeah, I don't even do that. <laughs> I read it if somebody tells me to read it. <laughs> and I even, wish and I even then, it goes that, in a pile, and yeah. you're like, oh, yeah, I've got to do that. Yeah, or I read, like, yeah, the first half of it, and I'm like, oh, this will be great. I'll come back to it later. And right. And I never do. Right. Yeah, I, you know, it's hard when you have a little kid or when you're just, like, a person in the world. It's just hard. It's just, it's just hard. hard. Who yeah. has time for all this stuff? But I, I, I yeah. think I think it's also a challenge when you're a writer and you are not necessarily single mindedly focused on a thing, but you have you know, you're writing for television and you're writing mm-hmm. a play and mm-hmm. you have to sort of compartmentalize your ideas. And for for me personally, I have uh, my compartments for the specific projects mm-hmm. and then I have the miscellaneous compartment which is where all the other stuff goes like the articles that need to be read and the TV shows yeah. that need to be watched and the other inspirations that are coming to me yeah. they go in that other compartment and yeah. I have to be considerate about the time I spend in that department you're better than I am I'm always like I have to do I have to read all these articles but in st- before that I have to watch Vanderpump Rules <laughs> the whole season Yeah, have to yeah, I have to. I have to know what Jax is up to. You know, I, I have to. <laughs> I have to say, I like the idea of ending this on Vanderpump. <laughs> I think that's kind of a brilliant. <laughs> that's who I it's am. It's a brilliant. That's who I am. Button. You've gotten to where I, who I am. <laughs> <laughs> the Eliza Eli Clark yeah. episode ends on Vanderpump. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. <laughs> Huge thanks to both Kemp Powers and Eliza Clark for chatting with me, and thank you to South Coast for sponsoring this month's episode. Go check out their work and the work of other playwrights who are part of Pacific Playwrights Festival. Now on to the beginning of the end of the episode. The subtext and At This Stage magazine would not happen if not for the generosity of Bill Bordy and the guidance of Danny Oliver from LA Stage Alliance. Go to thisstage.la and find the archives of our past interviews in addition to some intriguing articles about the performing arts in Los Angeles. Thank you to David at JTB Studios for providing perfectly intimate recording studio. Uh, If you have a moment, go find us on iTunes and subscribe, then give us a little rating. And you could follow us on Twitter at Subtext Podcast. And if you have the urge to say something privately, our email is thesubtextpodcast at gmail.com. This is the end. Tune in next month when I share my Gilmore Girls fan fiction. (laughs) 